Okay, hello everyone. Uh, super glad to be here. Um, today we're we'll, uh, going to talk about uh, type safety, about referring types, about a lot of things about performances, and uh, let's dive into the talk. Uh, so first, you can uh, get the slides. They are online uh, by flashing this QR code. We already put it there before, but if you haven't, you can still uh, get it. So we'll let uh, a really weird moment of 15 seconds for you to take the QR code if you have. And <laughs> okay, uh, so so who am I? Um, I'm an engineering team lead at Ledger. Uh, I manage one of the backend teams. Uh, basically, what we are doing, uh, we are doing uh, data on the blockchain, and we'll dive into what Ledger does uh, a bit later. And my co-presenter is... Uh, so I'm Raphael. Uh, I worked uh, with Valentin uh, at Ledger, uh, the backend blockchain, as a, as a staff engineer. And uh, and so uh, Ledger. Okay. So what is Ledger? So some of us, some of you may know it. Uh, basically, we are a hardware company. Uh, we uh, craft like um, hardware wallets to uh, hold cryptocurrencies uh, for the user to own their own keys uh, for their digital assets. And uh, uh, we are a bit more than 650 uh, in nine locations uh, with a lot of engineers, actually, so a very tech-heavy uh, company. Uh, we are a small scale community and we managed to thrive uh, despite the uh, assaults of uh, Node.js and Python guys. And uh, we are handling a lot of queries. Most of this is not like data, usual data spark uh, workflow. It's purely, um, it's purely uh, web services and uh, basically interfacing with the DBs. Um, so, <laughs> Let's uh, hear a little, a little story by Raphael. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a little story. So uh, it happened to us a long time ago. Uh, we find this, uh, something like this. It, it wasn't this code, but uh, uh, just a, a basic case class with a lot of strings. and. Yeah, uh, well, when it was used, it was cool, everything was good, but we encountered this problem. So I don't know if you saw, but the, the fields were uh, mixed. And uh, we tried something. And yeah, uh, this worked. Uh, it has some bugs. Obviously, but uh, yeah, it compiled and, and it works. So we say, okay, this has to be better. So first, we try the simplest way, type aliases. Okay, so far so good. We define it, it's readable. But uh, there's no validation and uh, that, um, substitution are um, still uh, possible. So, yeah, next, next step is value classes. We define our uh, six value classes, and yeah, it's better. This can't compile, but this can. So, we had to, to add some validation, and we wrote it. It was, yeah, always the same thing over and over. And uh, when, uh, when the validation uh, failed here, the code's crashing, and uh, we had to reboot the, the services and so on. So, okay, basic, we're uh, validate without crashing, introducing uh, or error uh, classes uh, uh, and uh, and define the same code again. Uh, define a parse method and with the either uh, uh, validate and if there's a problem, it is handled by the code. So we have to do this for the three for, and the three users. But we are, uh, as you saw, 
uh, we're in Scala 3, uh, so uh, why not open types? We, defi we define a no pack, uh, no pack types because basically it's just strings. There's no other uh, added value than the, than the, the meaning of the, uh, of the type. So opaque types are, are, are great. And then we, we, we wrote it. And um, this is just for one of the six of the many classes uh, in the in the code base, so uh, we know there's something even better. Uh, but before going, uh, I sum up. Uh, I don't know if you see at the at the at the bottom of the room, but uh, so we have. Uh, uh, so the first column is, uh, uh, is it uh, legible? So yeah, uh, basically the more we, we advance, the, the, the better it is. Uh, it is uh, here's a substitution of parameters possible. Then uh, do we validate? It is uh, transpa uh, referential transparent, and uh, and uh, about performance because uh, we have some uh, some big traffic and uh, that's a uh, really um, a subject for us. Uh, so uh, the the more performant the code is, the better, and. Uh, and at the end, we saw that all this code is really cumbersome to, to write, to read. And uh, really, that's uh, a lot of boilerplate. So we have to think smarter. And I. OK, so uh, actually, uh, we all know that developers are lazy, right? So we don't like to write code. Uh, so let's write it a smarter way. And this smarter way is called Iron. And actually, uh, it's a library which is not developed by Ledger. We made a largely contribution to it, uh, but it's not. Uh, but um, actually, we adapted it a lot for our ecosystem, but it's not a um, work creation. And uh, actually, what is Iron? Iron is a bit like Refine. So if you have, how many of you have used Refine? Yeah, so pretty a uh, good majority of the um, of the uh, of the uh, audience. Uh, refine Iron is like Refine, but using leveraging the whole uh, Scala free compiler to have a more concise and more precise design, and we'll see how to do it. Um, first, it is a composable type constraint library like Refine. Uh, in the, and what it uh, promised us is to have a true zero cost constraint application and um, and uh, performance. Um, impact of these uh, constraints. It was created uh, only for Scala 3, because it leveraged Scala 3 compiler, guess what? Uh, by Raphael, uh, which is here with us today. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so what is Iron? Uh, for first, it's a constraint library. So what is a constraint? Uh, imagine you want to have a positive constraint, because you want to have integers which are uh, only positive. And we know that we are in the JVM, and one of the bane of the JVM is not having an unsigned integer. So let's do, uh, let's do this and create a positive class. So what we do is we create a final class positive. It's just a marker, actually. Uh, it won't be in instantiated at all. Uh, and then we use the constraints uh, type class here to uh, instantiate a constraint on int with positive. Positive, uh, again, it's just a marker, actually. We could, we should, uh, we could have uh, taken any, uh, um, it's just a final class, uh, like a phantom type. That don't, I'm not a type expert, so I won't uh, get into it. And what we do, we override inline methods. And actually, uh, we care a lot about, about performance. and. When you are when you have a trait, you can mark the uh, methods to be in line in Scala 3. So you can force your implementer to have a zero cost method. And what we do is like we implement a test, we implement the message, and then we will use it. So how to use it? So first, uh, Iron introduced a little operator, uh, which is a bit like the refine uh, type constructor that you have with refine. It's uh, the um, 
I, I will say next uh, applied uh, positive applied to int to make things uh, less weird. Uh, but actually, what we can do is uh, typing it, typing values to have a constraint type. So this compiles and checks. Uh, uh, this compile. Uh, this does not compile. It's a bit for those again for those who use refine. It's a, uh, it's a, it's uh, like the same thing. It does not refine. You have a nice error message also uh, that telling us uh, what is uh, not compiling, why it is not compiling, and then finally, uh, you can compile it. And actually, what is very uh, funny is like it's mix the um, intersection and union type. Uh, uh, by uh, using it on the constraints, so you can uh, have uh, and constraints or constraints and compose them quite uh, concisely with uh, uh, native kind of native Scala syntax. And actually, uh, this is also a compile time error. And if you do uh, something which is bigger than 42, it will not compile either. So it's cool to have like compile time validation. Um, we love uh, validation because actually once the input is in the system, it cannot make bugs anymore. Uh, so how to add validation, uh, how to use them? Actually, what we need to do to have uh, something which is, um, which is not a value, uh, which is not a constant defined, uh, it needs to be in line actually to have compile time validation because uh, the compiler needs to put it into uh, needs to expand actually the inlining to uh, to get the um, to apply the constraints but if you have a runtime value you can use a very conjoint method which is dot refine which make uh, actually which is a bit like the require uh, row we um, we have seen uh, but uh, it is using uh, uh, actually you are using the constraints and this can be uh, used on a runtime value. And actually, we can rewrite the whole IBAN thing uh, in like one slide, uh, which with the help of refine either, which actually uh, does what it seems to be doing. This uh, just refine either string or the, con the type constraints, and um, and we manage to um, to get the IBAN uh, rolling like this. So. Uh, we have seen it's a bit like um, it's a bit like uh, verbose to use these constraints because actually when you refine it, you have to either have the constraint typed on the left hand side or uh, have the type argument on the right hand side. Uh, and so uh, what you want to do is to combine these constraints with opaque types to have truly uh, new, um, zero cost new types. Uh, in Scala with uh, constraints attached. So it's a pretty powerful concept. In terms of consciousness, uh, what you can do is to define uh, opaque types. So if you don't know, you can subtype. Uh, you can, if you have an opaque alias, you can subtype it uh, with a type. And actually, this is allowing us to have all the methods <laughs> on int uh, available. So if we want to make a truly black box, which is not, uh, which is opaque, you can do it. But if you want to have uh, an alias, which is on a still, which still is a subtype of int here or string or anything, uh, and then you can you can do it. And actually, uh, if there is no need for a, a very high amount of safety and you want to use the method, you can do it. And uh, what uh, Aaron is allowing us to do is also to use this refined typed ops, uh, which is a bit variable. Actually, it is verbose because there is a lack of something in the Scala 3 compiler because uh, there is a keyword which is not uh, yet used, which is erased. Uh, in the future, you will be uh, able to uh, mark uh, uh, things and methods as erased, so you ensure the compiler does not generate code for it. Uh, since we don't have erased, we have to use this quite verbose, so the starting type, the constraints, and the results. But if you use these two lines, you can have a truly zero cost abstraction. On your uh, on your types, on your data. Sorry. So, for instance, it's a real. Actually, from now every code example will be real code if we have in projection. Uh, so, if you uh, know a bit about Bitcoin, actually, uh, there is a unit, the atomic unit of Bitcoin, the least amount you can send is called a satoshi, and satoshis are limited, uh, both in um, um, both it must be positive and it must be less than something because we know in advance the maximum amount of Bitcoin that can be generated. And since we are using uh, cryptography and uh, elliptic, elliptic curves and a lot of things that manipulate large bytes, uh, large, large number, it can happen that if you have a, you know, U256, which 
get into the, the, the system, it can be problematic, so we have to limit it. And uh, what we can do is to type the constraint as, as private, so nothing outside of this module can use it. Then we constrain a type uh, by, this, by this thing, and then you, you define the refrain type ops, and boom, you have, the, uh, you have your uh, um, abstraction created, and it's very concise. Uh, you can do it, um, actually, you can. Uh, well, you, you can have all the benefits that we uh, explain with only three lines of codes per uh, per um, per item. So it's basically the best of the world. Uh, you have to introduce constraints into the, your uh, your um, your code base, but actually you already have them. It's just not encoded the same way. But uh, you have uh, legibility, you have because of the order, you have the performance, the maximal performance you can get. Since if you uh, wrap like a longer integers um, with value classes, you can have some cases where the value the any val and boxes anyway. For instance, when you are, I'm thinking, we are, one case is when you apply, uh, unapply. So if you, are, you do pattern matching with value, with value cases, you can end up with some performance issues. And also it takes some, um, when you unbox, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of memory and you don't, want, you don't want to use a lot of memory. Okay, so next we'll see uh, how Iron integrates with the whole Scala ecosystem. Uh, so first, it integrates with the two major um, uh, functional libraries uh, by having the custom refinement outputs. So you have seen we have done all our, um, our, our presentation with either, uh, but actually what is go good when you uh, have some, um, some validation to do is to aggregate uh, errors. So uh, by using uh, Iron Cats or Iron ZIO, you can uh, you can aggregate errors using a validated uh, the validation type from ZIO or using the parallel instance of either uh, to aggregate error. Next. Uh, we also, uh, there is also many integration in the ecosystem. Uh, basically, what you have done at Ledger is the Sirius, the Dubi, the Skunk, and half of the Tapir integration. Uh, it is also very well integrated with JSON and tests. Uh, and we'll see a whole, um, a whole part on how to, uh, to integrate a library with Iron. It's very simple and encourage you, if you have even internal library, to do it because uh, it's very few lines of code and, uh, and you can bring a lot of value. Okay, so this is another example we have in the code base. So basically we have tags which have name and values and we need, because it's user input, we need to limit their length. Uh, so what we can do is simply define an object tag, you define constraints, unpack types, constraints, opac types, and you have your uh, uh, valid, you have your case class, which is perfectly defined and described by the types you uh, put into it. And for instance, if you uh, want to use it with Tapir, with the Iron Tapir integration, you can query an option of tag. And actually, Tapir will do the whole manipulation uh, and uh, integration to have like a 400 when you have a bad input and so on. <coughs> And another example of integration with Dubi. So we are doing pretty funny SQL also in, uh, at Ledger. <laughs> uh, so you have a get latest tag by account. So actually, uh, it's all in all semantics, we have accounts. Uh, accounts have positions. So the position is like an asset you own. Uh, and this position can have uh, tags, uh, name, and values. And what we want to do is search uh, uh, account objects uh, using certain uh, names and values. So what we can do, we do our little uh, SQL queries, uh, special thing for JSON object tag, which is uh, awesome to do only one run trip with the database. Uh, and then you, you just interpolate things. And if you have the Iron Doobie integration in place, it just works. And you pass, uh, you validate that the, it knows how to read uh, tags and values and to write tags and values. And that's very, very important because you can constraints type in your domain model and then have this domain model integration, uh, which is directly, uh, you can feed your model directly from your database uh, without having this funny like data classes, you have to mix the whole row and so on. 
um, that's, so yes, how to write an integration. And uh, to show you that, I will show you the entire code of the Doobie integration. Let's do it. Boom. <laughs> it's literally this. So when you integrate with the library, you publish a new module only for this thing. So it's a bit, <laughs> uh, sorry. But uh, so it's a bit complicated. So we'll get into it. It uses a lot of uh, Scala three features. So it will be the occasion to get uh, into it. So first, what we have, we, what uh, integration is in two parts. In general, you have one part which is about the constraints part, and one part which is about the um, new type part. So the refine type ops. Uh, so first for the constraints, so what we uh, do is like we want to do an inline given because we want everything to be inline. Actually, our constraints needs, does not need to uh, have any runtime value, it's raw given. Uh, so uh, we do an inline given, you can do it actually, uh, it can do pretty uh, some hazardous uh, recursive things uh, and the compiler will warn you if it's not efficient, but uh, you can do inline givens and we require the type class instance. So in this case, it's a Doobie me meta. And uh, actually what we need to do is to have a, uh, to use a constraints um, to constrain, actually, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what we need to do is to have a constraint which is valid for the type A. So we need to see, uh, have an instances of constraint of A and C because actually the constraint needs to be applied on A. And then uh, actually for the meta uh, implementation, you need to have a show. So let's put the show. Uh, and then you have the meta of A constrained by C. And we just map and refine either an identity because uh, when you map things back, we know that uh, to convert uh, like a uh, we uh, um, a constant by c to a. It's uh, you just need to cast, so it's an identity no case. Uh, and for the um, refine uh, type of integration, what a um, very incredible thing which is in this library, it has custom mirrors. So if you have used uh, Scala free derivation, how many of you have used the Scala free derivation features? Uh, so it's a <laughs> they are pretty uh, uh, pretty powerful uh, like stock derivation, not using Manolia, and uh, they are using a concept called mirrors. So you can uh, have uh, um, um, you can have a uh, actually you know, a type description of your data structure uh, using uh, the compiler. And what we are doing here is like uh, in Iron, there is a mirror type, which is a mirror which is specialized on uh, constraints types. So using uh, this refine type of that mirror of T, you need, your T needs to be extending a refine type ops. And it, this M will expose type members, which corresponds to several, um, to several, uh, to several, um, uh, Things that that are encoded by the reference type of that mirror. So for, instance, for instance, the base type, the constraints type, the result type. And what we can, what we do also is to have an evidence of a meta. So we need to have a meta, but we don't, doesn't need to have a meta on uh, on the T. We need to have a meta of the underlying constraints constraints type. So we need to have the former thing we show you uh, just before here. And so you, you use a ty uh, the dependent typing on M to get the iron type, and this works actually. Uh, and you can uh, get your meta of T, and actually uh, it's a lot, of, a bit of boilerplate, but mind that this is a whole code for the whole integration. Uh, we can safely cast it and have no performance cost whatsoever because it is. Uh, we already know that the iron type and the T are equivalent because M is present. And last but not least, some takeaway. Yeah. Um, so um, the first thing uh, Iron uh, gave to us, it um, as uh, Yaron Miski said, uh, it really allows us to making illegal state unrepresentable in the code. That's the main point. If you have to remember something of this, uh, this talk, this this is this. And the other thing, it um, uh, reduce our feedback loop uh, to the minimum because uh, we don't want to catch bugs in prod or uh, even before in staging test, it's long. Here, we have the feedback loop at the compile time. So uh, it doesn't uh, prevent us to write tests and so on, but uh, we catch a lot of things 
uh, at, uh, at compile time. So the productivity is way better than before. And yeah, our code is also uh, has a, um, a better quality thanks to thanks to Aaron. And then, yeah, the Scala 3 type system is uh, really uh, awesome and powerful. And uh, use it, please. <laughs> so uh, I think we have some really good time. Uh, yeah, it's OK. Uh, we are open to questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Can you hear me? Um, so how do you handle errors um, for values that you get dynamically? For instance, if you're reading up a, a JSON document, you're not going to get compile time uh, guarantees. Yeah, actually, what we have, uh, what we've seen is like you can, do, do, if you have a runtime value, you can use a refine either or refine whatever you want in terms of, uh, in term of um, result type. And it will uh, handle this, uh, this, aggreg this aggregation for you. And uh, actually, what we do also is to use a functional principle that is uh, putting the validation and the side effects at the frontier of the system. So usually, 99% of our uh, like errors are caught by the Tapir integration before they reach our code. Or the Dubi integration also. Um, thank you very much. It was extremely uh, impressive. Uh, I have some memories about Liquid Haskell and uh, Scala Liquid, I don't know, uh, uh, Refined, maybe. Uh, and there are a lot of difficulties to hold the precondition. Uh, and how does it work when you try to refine something that comes from the real world and you try to keep the, the precondition uh, during the usage of your uh, consumed value? Yeah, actually, one thing Aaron does not prevent you to do is to like take two positive integers and do a minus and having a negative yeah. one okay. and do things because yes, uh, it's not like uh, encoded truly in the type system because you cannot. It's a. It's a we are using a bit uh, compiler as a theorem prover here and it cannot prove uh, proving things hard basically. <laughs> Uh, so that's why I talk a bit about the subtyping relationship you can have with opaque types. Uh, you can use it, you can also not use it and uh, ensure that the validation are correct at the end. Uh, and actually, when you have a type, when you have a type like um, A constrained by C, uh, you can, um, what you can do is, if you want to create an I constrained by C, you have to use this refi dot refine extension method. And actually, if you want to cast it raw, you can use uh, dot .refine, it will be the equivalent of require. And uh, require crashes when there is a bad input. Uh, but uh, anyway, you can use a Scalafix rules, for instance, for to, uh, to uh, make all the refine uh, calls disappear and show that you need to have a better error handling because to create an instance of the type, you need to refine option or refine header. And uh, normally, it will, it will check that this time. Thank you. And currently, do you think that uh, it's obviously that you should use for every Scala project, or there is some uh, dirty corner? Yeah, actually, uh, we use it for quite some time right now, and we don't have, we haven't seen some uh, um, some uh, dirty corners. Uh, there is some rough edges like the refine type ops uh, integration. You have to specify the whole thing. It's a bit verbose and so on. Uh, but actually, uh, we use it in production every day, and it works quite well. So I would say yes. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much. As long as you're in Scala 3. <laughs> so I have a related question. Oh, sorry. OK. Uh, so it's so in, in Scala, generally, you have a long compile time, so how, how does it affect compile time? Is it, is it a big uh, increase or just a uh, small It's, uh, uh, honestly, I don't see the, the price of uh, iron uh, at compile time. Uh, 
It's a big advantage versus a, a refine because we haven't discussed the match between Ethereum and Iron, but there is some uh, a, a detailed comparison in the documentation of the lib if you want to uh, to read it. But actually, uh, since uh, uh, Iron is using a lot of Scala-free compiler features and no like uh, shapeless uh, implicit wizardy, uh, uh, <laughs> basically, uh, the, um, the, uh, the compile time is uh, very reasonable. And as Raphael said, uh, you don't see it. Thank you. So I have another question. Uh, have you ever got a uh, succeeded at creating a Spark encoder that uses these types? And <laughs> we don't use Spark. <laughs> you don't. Okay. Now the, the, the concept I'm looking. Maybe there is no. a success report mm. from the library author. Is it? Uh, have you got the any thing? Is, uh, maybe the maybe Raphael would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the question is: are, are there any success reports about creating? Um, uh, Spark encoders uh, using iron types because I can see the concept would be uh, I have that data frame that come from the Python types and it has no types because Python um, and anyway that's general SQL based thing but I want to be able to promote that data frame into a data set of a tuple of iron types and then continue manipulating it so that uh, my my data sets are basically should be correctly typed and proven using the library I'm I would love to have this because I love using George uh, Orwell's techniques to make sure that the the code cannot stray outside of the boundaries. I never used a Spark, and I'm not aware of anyone uh, trying to use Iron in Spark or similar libraries frameworks. And um, but I don't I don't see why it shouldn't be possible because uh, it's just uh, type classes. So uh, I guess Sparks. Spark also uses type class. It does not. No, uh, yeah. Okay. But uh, I think the idea is still interesting, and then maybe I will uh, work on it to make a Spark integration. Yeah. Actually, awesome. if I can just add something, um, uh, if you take the Tapir integration, uh, it's a comp it compiles the constraints into a validator for Tapir, but it's not like a, a random like filter or boolean filter on the endpoints it's a real uh, native uh, tapir validator so it should be possible i think to create a sql expression in spark to uh, uh from the constraints there is no uh, reason not yeah that's clearly an avenue um so yeah it's it's uncharted territory but it's uh, it would look to be a very uh, very useful development if that ever happens like Okay, so uh, have a very nice uh, lunch and uh, see you soon. Bye.